The idea of the garden in the city is actually also something we discussed the very first time I met Christian Philipp Müller more than 20 years ago in the very early 90s um, when he was uh, involved in researches of, um, of garden projects. Christian Philipp Müller works in many different media, actually updating artistic models of historical conceptualism and institutional critique. He's often been described as a pathfinder whose work examines issues as the social and aesthetic specifics of space. And this idea of the pathfinder, I think, is so interesting in relation to the topic of the garden. I found no, an older quote where Christian Philipp Müller actually quoted a sentence from Anton Joseph Desalier d'Argonsville's book, The Practical Theory of Gardening, which was first published in Paris in 1747. Here's the quote. Pass through a garden are like roads through a town. They connect one place to another and are means of getting from one part of the garden to another in the same way as guidebooks or roads. Christian Philippe Müller has exhibited in many, many exhibitions the Venice Biennale, Documenta in Kassel. Our first collaboration was Qui Qua U, a regard sur l'art en Allemagne in 1992 at Arc Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. He's also done many different public art projects, especially to be mentioned in Lüneburg at the university, a project about branding of a campus at Bard College in Annandale on Hudson, and also interesting in relation to the cloister here of uh, Peter Zumthor and the garden of Piet Udov in the cloister gardens of Melk in Austria. Since 2011, Christian Philipp is the dean of the Kunsthochschule in Kassel. A very warm welcome to Christian Philipp Müller. Good evening. Thanks a lot uh, for staying, uh, not just for me, but for all those other poor people who come after me. <laughs> In the cold, I hope you have your old blankets, and I hope those who don't have a blanket will get one soon. Um, thanks, uh, Hans Ulrich, for inviting me. Thanks for the incredible, nice staff taking care of us here uh, tonight. And, uh, there's, uh, in the lobby of the Serpentine Gallery, is a plasma screen. Uh, also running tomorrow, there's a, um, a loop of films, uh, The New World, which is uh, the sc a sculpture of mine, which is not a garden, <laughs> the sculpture with plants. Um, it's running in the lobby. Okay, but let's start. I don't want to keep you waiting too long. This monitor is totally free frozen, frozen. <laughs> okay. Um, it's the year 2006. Half a year before, Roman Ondak and myself got invited to do a, a kind of intervention in the cloisters of Melk Abbey, or Melk Monastery, about an hour and a half outside of Vienna. The topic, or the theme, was Mozart. So the Benedictine monks went to the uh, offices of public art and lower, lower um, Austria, and ask, you know, could you or could you suggest some artists to to deal uh, to do a work with a Mozart? And uh, Roman and myself, we, you know, we came into the game rather late, 2005. So many other artists had already come up with exciting, fantastic, huge projects on Mozart, and both of us very much liked the site. We got invited to go there, and the first thing we were invited to see was a pink bright pleasure pavilion. When you come to a monastery, you don't really think <laughs> in terms of a pleasure pavilion. Uh, so what do monks do for pleasure, for fun? <laughs> so <laughs> there's a time in the winter before spring where they have to, you know, they're not allowed to eat certain foods. And in the 18th century, when this pavilion was built and the people in charge of tourism and art, funnily enough, it's put together, they always tell me, don't talk about Lust Pavilion or Pleasure Pavilion, talk about Garden Pavilion, which is so ordinary and so kind of neutral, but this is, is or was never a neutral place, because you go inside and you see, that's not Tiepolo, this guy is called Johann Bergel, and there you go. 1764, not 2011, but 1764, there's the connection to Mozart. His father wrote to his wife in Salzburg about something totally exciting. 
he and little Wolfgang Amadeus were eating a potato, the first fruit, the first taste of the new world. So the same year, Bergel painted the frescoes, the inside of this pleasure pavilion. The purpose of this pavilion was to lift up the spirits of the poor monks. Because after feasting for a long time, you know, as, as a kind of uh, cure, their bad blood was taken out. And they were super weak. And so these poor, weak monks were invited into the pleasure pavilion to do all the things that were always forbidden during the year. And since they could not go on vacation, and the garden has, is part of the program of a, of, a, of a Benedictine cloister, so they cannot leave. They have to stay on the grounds. So we were also told, Roman and myself, we were not allowed to go inside the cloister to do our Mozart intervention, but actually to do it in the garden. But this, this was the first sight we saw. And this, this kind of uh, frescoes cu uh, culminate in a kind of, they start at the bottom. They show us baskets of fruits, still lives of kind of local foods, apples, pears, mushrooms. But then they're combined with Mediterranean foods, which we assume the painter has seen, like uh, melons, uh, um, oranges, lemons, but then they're combined with peppers, with all kinds of other fantastic things like chocolate trees, coffee trees, you see ostriches, you see elephants. The poor painter had no idea what actually was uh, living or what was growing in, in, the, in, in the New World, in the, in the Americas. Okay, so there I had my topic. And <laughs> Okay, there are 16 monks left, and sometimes there's a new one, you know, applying to be a monk, which is called a novice. And uh, in this uh, pleasure pavilion are displayed the scenes between Christopher Columbus coming to the New World and uh, of uh, receiving gifts from the noble Indians. And those Indians are drinking champagne out of very delicate glasses. They're wearing thick, uh, chains of per uh, uh, necklaces of uh, pearls and um, they're a mix of kind of Indians because they wear kind of turbans so it's Arabs a bit, uh, but they're also wearing feathered crowns so I think it's somehow uh, related to the noble um, wild to the Jean-Jean Croissant back to nature so somehow to savages that you know nature was good and culture was evil and um, but all this, all this the painter painted, he had never seen with his own eyes. He just imagined it. Uh, I went after, after the first re uh, research visit, uh, I went to, uh, to the library because I wanted to find traces. Did these Benedictine monks go to the New World or have they any kind of maps of the New World? So there was a tiny little travel guide and it had fold out maps, fantastically beautiful Rococo maps of the New and the Old World. I also found uh, another little link to Mozart. Uh, his uh, Freemason buddy, uh, Joaquin, a Dutch uh, botanist who was sent by the emperor to the New World to capture all the rare varieties. So the a bean is or was something super exotic at the time and of course worth to be pictured and painted. Okay, here we are at the third and the top level of the monastery gardens. This is a, uh, actually like in the, in the church, you have three levels. The highest level is the, is the Holy Spirit. And uh, in this uh, kind of basin or pond, the water is collected to nourish the whole garden. When the water is being brought in, of course it becomes a mirror, it bring, brings the sky down to earth and then from this kind of water reservoir the whole garden gets the water that the plant get the water from this not by rain but the water is pumped up from the danube from a little river next to the danube and then filled in the fish that are normally housed in here they have to uh, go to a, a pond in the forested area during the winter because this water is not deep enough they would f freeze to death like you guys here so what you see here is my <laughs> little intervention, um, a kind of a pedestal of concrete. Uh, uh, on top is a steel container that is filled with soil. 
And uh, when um, the show was supposed to open May 1st, and uh, this is uh, what then happened. Basically, the sculpture disappears, and out of the sculpture, something new comes. I told the um, 500 people who came to the opening, you know, the, all the monks, the, uh, what do you call it, the head monk, the, the app, the, what do you call it, ab, ab, abbot, the abbot, has, he was wearing a gigantic cross and super long hair, it's really, you know, hip. And so I told them in my speech there would be a jungle, like an Indian jungle growing here, of all as a present, the present to the Indians, to us Europeans from the old world. Because we brought them influenza, which made them, sadly enough, disappear, die out. And they gave us potatoes, they gave us beans, they gave us pumpkins, they gave us a lot of varieties. Okay, five minutes more. Uh, so I have to speed up here. <laughs> so when I told them, when I told them that this will be a jungle, they said, okay, please, you know, just no way, okay? <laughs> Two months later, this happened, okay? <laughs> so every year, there's not a, a kind of this miracle of nature taking place. A, a, a jungle is growing each year, but each year something new happens actually also. So there's one year, the, the second year we did a book, the new world, um, the, uh, the um, next year we did a picnic. And the, the next year were some seed pockets where we were uh, giving away the kind of three sisters. And the sis three sisters is an Indian planting method, a kind of permaculture. They all keep each other, and they nourish each other, they keep each other alive, which is the stalk, the kind of verticality is corn. Then around uh, uh, grows uh, uh, the beans, and then on the ground, for the shaded areas, are the uh, pumpkins. And so the kind of idea was growing all over, and it keeps growing because you can, uh, can harvest these seeds from your plants that you grow in your own garden. Uh, that's a little detail. Um, that's uh, incredibly uh, dear Andrea Edelbacher, who is actually a trained photographer who tends to this uh, sculpture each year. And um, she says the biggest challenge is actually a dock, because always in the spring when she brings on the very tender plants, the dock just happens to trample it over. Uh, maybe we can, uh, before I show you how it looks right now, we can maybe switch for a few minutes to the film which runs in the lobby, but it's actually much nicer to see it on here. And everything you see here, you can also eat. That's why there's every year a kind of a harvest feast that what you see, you eat. It becomes you. Um, and uh, I did part of this book, The New World. Uh, I did an interview with a kind of seed vault which, call, which is called Noah's Ark. And I asked him, which importance do fruit and vegetable varieties originally coming from the New World have in Austria today? And the potato actually came to Europe in the late 16th century. Potato growing was decreed top down. Many provincial rulers took considerable efforts to establish the cultivation of potatoes with peasants and on their own estate and so to improve the food situation. When I was tracking down recipes and uh, cook in cookbooks from the Salzburg area from like the late 19th century, I was finding recipes of paradisers or tomatoes, and they still said that the cannibals from the Fiji Islands eat this together with the human meat. <laughs> bon appétit. <laughs> and I will leave it at that. Thank you very much.